tonight, God, we're, we're lifting more than our words to you. 
We're lifting our hearts to you, God. Why don't we all just lift our hands? Sing this with me. We want to walk with you and talk with you. Not miss a single thing you do. Discern the way and how you want to move. We want to take the time to hear your heart. Get to know the friend you are. Partner in the things you want to do. Cause we're not satisfied with empty words, not satisfied with playing church. We want a real encounter. We want a real encounter. We won't settle for a lukewarm faith. We're living for the face to face. We want a Self-righteous plans that we all to build to fear of man. The lie I have to work my way to you. And flip every table of religiousness to holiness is all that's left. Just worshipers in spirit and in truth. Sing that again. Tear down the altars of self-righteous plans. The idols built to fear of man The lie I have to work my way to you And flip every table of religiousness To holiness is all that's left Just worshippers in spirit and in truth Yes, cause we're not satisfied with empty words Not satisfied with playing church. 
and tell them only Jesus and I'll bring more than my words but all of my heart to you Jesus only Jesus sing all all that I want all that I want is you Jesus we just ask Lord that tonight that you would be the one that sits on the throne of our hearts God we just say our hearts really are saying we only want you Jesus and you alone you have permission to tear down every other idol every other thing that's exalted above you tonight we are saying you and you alone are what we want God I ask Lord that as we continue tonight that you would just continue in this heart cry, God, that as we go into the word, Lord, that you would further this in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, guys. We're gonna continue the night, so you guys are welcome to go and find your seats. And as you guys find your seats, meet somebody that you don't know, say hi, ask them how they're doing, how their day has been going. guys if you came in a little bit late I just want to say hello welcome to Monday night and I wanted to see again who is here for the very first time this is your first Monday night can I just see a wave of hands well welcome we're so excited that you're here tonight we are about to get into the word and I'm so excited but before that I have a very fun very special announcement and so if I could get something on the screen. All right, guys, this is so exciting. This summer, we have our circuit rider school. And usually we have a couple throughout the nation. But this year, we have only one. And it is happening June 28th through July 5th here in Orange County. Here, actually, in this very room, we'll be having our sessions. And what Circuit Rider School is, if you don't know, it's a 10-day leadership intensive. Okay, so if you have been thinking to yourself, man, I want to grow in my relationship with Jesus. I know God has called me to reach my generation. I feel like I'm a leader. And you have been wanting to get poured into, you've been wanting to get trained in your uh, leadership skills, you maybe have been wanting to get trained in specific skills, maybe media, worship, preaching, well, we have all of that in this circuit rider school, so there are main corporate sessions, but we also have different tracks that you get to be a part of, where you get to get trained in specific skill sets, okay, and guys, I'm going to make a bold statement, okay, I believe 100% wholeheartedly that Circuit Rider Schools is the best way to spend 10 days. And honestly, I think it's the very best thing that you could do with your summer. Okay, you can go on vacations. You can, you know, do all of that with your summer. But when do you get time to fully concentrate on your relationship with Jesus and who he's made you to be as a leader? Okay, I did Circuit Rider School a couple years back, 2017, and it changed my life, okay? I thought I knew Jesus. I thought I had a good relationship with Jesus, but man, you're right. I thought, <laughs> and I did not realize that I could actually go even deeper in my relationship with Jesus, and to this day, there are things I learned back then that God set me free from, breakthroughs I had, and skill sets I learned that I am walking in today. So, I, I think that no matter what you have going on this summer, that you can clear some time 
between these dates, June 28th, July 5th, whatever you got, cancel it. And what I'm actually going to have us do, because for our special Monday night audience, we actually have something very um, only for you guys, special, okay? We're giving you guys a deal that only is available tonight, okay? So you are very lucky that you chose to come tonight to Monday night because everybody else, they don't get the deal. It's only for you guys in this room tonight. Usually the price is $6.50, but for you tonight and tonight only, it is going to be $4.99. But only, only, only if you scan this QR code and fill out this form tonight, okay? So you can't take a picture of this QR code and sign up tomorrow. It is only tonight. So what I'm going to have everybody do right now is take out your phones, and I want you guys to scan the QR code. And I'm going to do it too because I need, I need some more leadership skills. I want the discount. Okay, so I'm going to fill this out with you guys real time. So I want you guys to fill this out right now. So you're going to go to this form. Wave your, wave your phone when you're there. Okay, amazing. We're going to fill this out together. So first, it says a first name. So I'm going to put my name, Hope. Put, put your name. Okay, then I'm going to put my last name, Donathan. All right. Okay, then, then I'm going to, this is so simple, guys. I'm going to put my number, and I'm going to keep that to myself, but you put your number. <laughs> um, and then your email, and that's literally it. And then you're just going to press OK. Wow, that was so easy. And so that is going to get you guys a special deal, but it's not actually the application. So this is just the form that notifies our people when they reach out to you after you apply that you are here tonight and that you get this special deal. But you still actually have to go to the website and fill out the application before May 15th. And you have to pay the down uh, deposit before May 15th to be able to get this deal. But that's like literally so simple. $4.99, that's like the best deal of a lifetime. That's like nothing um, for a lifetime investment on yourself. So um, that I believe is all the announcements that I have for us tonight. And so I get the privilege of getting to introduce our speaker tonight. We're about to get into the word. Are you guys ready? Okay, can we welcome up Zach Nash? Thank you, Hope. Thank you, Hope. Can I get the table? Somebody got the table for me? Thanks, guys. Oh, let's go, Timmy. Give it up for Timmy. Radical servant. All right, guys, I just got to move a few things back. I just don't want to, I don't want to trip like, like that. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> got to make space. All right. You guys doing good? Yeah. You have a good day? Yeah. What about the rest of you? Yeah. Anybody have a bad day? It's okay. Silence. Getting set up here, guys. All right, got all my stuff. Who's gonna come to the Who's gonna come to the school? See our school. Anybody coming? But honestly, it's okay if you're not. Is anybody really feeling like you want to come? Just raise your hand high. Like, maybe stand up if you feel like you're gonna come. I I would love to see faces, even if you're just thinking about it. Let's go. Man, great decision. Best decision. All right, we're good. All right, guys. I'm going to read a verse to you. I'm going to read seven verses because we're in a series. Who's been coming to the, to the series we've been doing on love? A couple of you. Okay. We've been doing a series on love out of 1 Corinthians 13. So I'm going to read some verses real quick. It says this. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers, who's got prophetic powers in the house? A couple people, okay. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Say, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have, deliver, deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. 
Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. So we've been in this series going through those verses. Nick took us through that final verse, verse 7, last week. And so this week, I've, I just was wrestling with what, are we going to keep going? We are going to keep going, but we needed to pull the car over a little bit tonight and just make sure that the right person is driving the car. Because it's possible, hear me, hear me, hear me. It's possible for you and I to be living in the Father's house. It's possible that we can be living in the Father's house, doing all the right things, but be just as lost as the younger, younger son who went and spent everything in a foreign land. It's possible. So we're going we're gonna to look into Luke 15 tonight. You can turn there if you want, put your finger in there. We're, we're going to get there hopefully at some point. But wherever you f- may find yourself on the spectrum tonight of, you know, that maybe you're in that wayward season and you've been running from God or you feel that long, like, I just want to go, I want to go explore this area. I want to do this. I want to gain this. Or maybe you're, find yourself more on the spectrum of like, man, I can just feel that kind of religious dryness that my quiet times aren't very good. I'm not really connecting with God, but I'm doing all the right stuff. Or maybe you're in the middle, or maybe you're just doused in the love of God. Wherever you're at on that spectrum, I feel like tonight there's an invitation by the Holy Spirit saying, I want to take you deeper. I want to take you deeper. Because here's the deal. It's one thing to hear truth. It's a completely different thing to be touched by truth. It's one thing to pursue Jesus. It's another thing to actually touch him. You know the story, right? There's the woman with the issue of blood, right? A lot of people walked around Jesus when he was on the earth. Tons of people, like crowds would get around him. But there's one woman who sticks out in particular for touching the hem of his garment. And that word in Mark chapter 5, where the word touch, if you break it down in the Greek, this is what it means. It means to attach yourself to something and be lit on fire. That's what that word touch means. It means to attach yourself to something and not let go until you're burning. And so, man, I just felt tonight like I don't want to just go through the motions, read some good verses. Like we can read about the love of God in this book, but if it doesn't become real, if we don't touch it and or we're not set aflame by it, then what's the point? Come on, you can live in the Father's house, do all the right stuff, but miss the Father. So tonight the invitation is we got to let go of whatever it is that's keeping us from encountering his love and being lit on fire by it. Is anybody in for that tonight? Because here's my honest assessment. You ready? Anybody ready? Here's my honest assessment as we were worshiping. I was looking across the room. I was praying. And I just felt the Father smiling over the room. But it was like this kind of smirk. And it was like he was looking at individuals in the room. And he says, oh, they've been resisting. But tonight, I'm going to break through the resistance. He says, some of them have just been, you know, kind of. And I just felt the smile of the Father over that resistance and that kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm just, you know. And I just felt the smile and the love of God saying, I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you. So I can't see everybody in the back corner back there, but I just want to tell you, God's coming for you. I can see you guys, so I'm telling you, God's coming for you. This section, guess what? Oh, man, he's coming for you. He's coming for you. This little group right here, guess what? Oh, you, he's coming for you. Back row bandits back there. You can't escape him back there. I'm telling you, he's got a long arm he can reach. Over here, okay. Some hunger over here. This, this section, you, oh, man. Double portion coming over here, okay. No, it's. Double portion. 
I got more notes than we're going to get through tonight, but so I'm just kind of, I'm going to, we're going to, we're, we're going somewhere together and the Holy Spirit's going to help us find our way because here's, here's the truth is that what we're, what we need to happen tonight, I can't do for you. So I should just put the mic down and quit because only the Holy Spirit can pour out the love of God in your heart. Romans 5. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And when it says that he pours out the love of God into our heart, it's a, it's a continual flooding. So it's not like a one-time moment. Yeah, I encountered God's love when I was 13 at camp, and it was awesome, and so now I'm just going through the motions. No, come on, man. When Jesus spilled his blood on the cross, ascended to the right hand of the Father, sent forth the Spirit, man, that faucet opened, and it's never closed. It's not just like a little drip. It's like every once in a while we just kind of get, no. The Holy Spirit wants us to be consistently yielded over to the flooding of God's love in our own heart. So here's the deal. We had to pull the car over because if we're not touched by love, how can we love? If we don't know enduring love for us as individuals, how will we ever offer enduring love to others? If we don't know the love that bears all things, how can we offer love that bears all things? If we don't know the hope of the love of Christ that keeps believing, that keeps believing when everything seems like it's not going to make it, like we're not going to get there, Jesus doesn't retreat and give up and say, oh, I got it wrong on this one. No, he keeps believing. He keeps hoping. So if that hope hasn't touched us, how can we offer it to the world? So tonight, we're asking the Holy Spirit, come and douse us in the love of God. Not just a little drop, not just some good knowledge. There's this, Paul prays this prayer in, first, uh, in Ephesians 3, uh, I think it's verse 17. And he prays that we would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. I want you to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. How is that possible? What does that even mean? It means we desperately need the Holy Spirit to make it real to us. It's got to go so far beyond I read it on a page to he, he imprinted it on my heart. He imprinted it on my heart. And so tonight, that's what we're asking. We're asking that. So Brennan Manning writes this. He says, in human beings... Love is a quality, a high-prized virtue. In God, love is his identity. I'm going to read it again. It, for human beings, for us, love is a quality, it's a high-prized virtue. But in God, love is his identity. It's who he is. He can't be anything different. Did you know that? It's not like he can turn that part off of him when he gets offended. He doesn't get offended. He loves. So like when the Bible says God is love, that means that forever and always God is consuming love. I was uh, messaging an old buddy, an old friend uh, recently, and we were talking about theology. And we were talking about kind of the unfortunate thing that can happen at times. And maybe you've seen this. Is that At times, it seems like some people... Um, we're all prone to it as we get older, as we get deeper in uh, knowledge or understanding of maybe theology, that at times when people get to this level of like they really have a deep grasp on the scriptures and theologically they could debate you and just shred you, it's kind of like they, they get a little bit at times can be puffed up and maybe they know more, but they're a little bit less filled with mercy. Have you ever seen that YouTuber out there who's just like, man, you don't want to debate the guy but you're just kind of like, man, you know the stuff, but you don't really look like him. So we were, we were talking about that because I was, I was, I'm a theology nerd, so I love to study. It's like my favorite pastime is like learning theology, so I'm kind of a nerd that way. But I was texting him. I was like, I don't want to become that guy. Can I get a witness, any witness in the room? I don't want to become the guy who knows the stuff but does not have a loving bone in my body. And so we were talking about that, and he said a few things to me that have just been haunting me in a really, really good, profound way the last few weeks. He said, Zach, if your God is angry, you'll be angry. He said, if your God is angry, you'll be angry. 
messaging back and forth. It was like, yeah, it's like, I know God, like, there's anger is real. Like, God experiences anger. It's in the Bible. But I said, I feel like his disposition ultimately is that he's a benevolent father. He's extremely good and loving and merciful. And he says, exactly. He said, Zach, God is heartbroken. And it was that line that has been haunting me. I don't know if you've ever thought about God as being heartbroken. And I don't want you to think like heartbroken as disappointed, right? There's that kind of heartbroken, like, I can't believe you did it again. I'm heartbroken. I'm so disappointed. No, that's not, that's not the love of the Father. And so we want to we dive in a little bit tonight because we need the love of God to renew our mind so that we can see him rightly. We need the love of God to renew our mind so that we can see him rightly. And so there's, there's this tension of like, I want to stand for truth. And I, I'm telling you, like, don't hear what I'm not saying. I refuse to compromise truth to be, quote, unquote, more loving. That's not helpful. That's not loving. That's not, we're not going to do that. We're going to stand for truth. Scripture is very clear. We're going to stand for truth. But at the same time, I want to refuse. Hear me. I want to refuse to, be, to not be filled with mercy and love for the broken. I want to refuse it. And so I think the reality is that the deeper we go theologically, the more consumed with mercy we should be because that's the God of Scripture. Someone once wrote this. Someone once wrote this. He said, um, you can safely assume that you have made God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. Let that sink in for a second. You can safely assume that you have made God in your own image when it turns out God hates all the same people you do. God is heartbroken. And I'm telling you tonight, my goal, I'm hoping, put myself in this category, that the love of the Father would come and offend every religious bone we have in our body. I'm just, I'm begging the Holy Spirit, make it so real, offend us offend us with how outlandish your love and your mercy really is. It's imperative that we let the Holy Spirit renew our mind when it comes to the nature of the Father and his disposition toward humanity and us as individuals. We've got to do that. We've got to let him do it. So here's the deal. We inherited a faulty view of the Father from Adam in the garden. We didn't just, we didn't just inherit... Um, I need to be forgiven now. We do need to be forgiven. But we inherited much more from him than just, I need to be forgiven. We inherited a completely wrong view of what the Father's like. I'm going to prove it to you. Is that okay? So you know the story, Genesis 1, right? God's creating everything, and then it says, what does he do? He makes man in his own image. And it says he, he formed man from the dust, right? He makes man. And all of a sudden, he breathes the breath of life into man. And think about this. Put, put yourself, you got to put yourself in the story. you gotta, you got to read the scriptures this way. you got to put yourself in there. Think about it. God gets down. He stoops down with his hands. He gets his fingernails dirty, and he creates man. And, like, if you were going to breathe in someone's nose, how close would you have to get? Like, like, for me to the front row, this close? No, closer. Like, uncomfortably close. Like, like, like I'm not going to even try right now because it would be so uncomfortable. Like, you got to get that close. Put yourself in the story. So he breathes the breath of life into his nostrils, into his nose. And think about it. All of a sudden, Adam opens his eyes face to face with uncreated beauty. Face to face. Genesis 1, 26 to 28 says that God made man in his image. And then the scriptures say that God blessed him. God blessed him. Again, I need you to see this, word, this picture, this word picture. What it, what it really means when it says God blessed him, it's that God stooped down. He knelt down over man, over Adam, and he began to adore him. 
What does the Bible say? We love God because he first loved us. You see, we can't properly adore and give affection to him unless we first receive it. You, you missed it. You missed it. We can't properly love him unless we know what love looks like. When he made man, he knelt down over him and he uncomfortably started pouring out affection and adoration over Adam. I want to ask you a question. What had Adam done up to that point to deserve that type of adoration? I need an answer. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Had he prayed for the sick? Had he had a quiet time? Has he given money to a homeless person? Has he walked an old lady across the street? Did he pay for the person behind him in Starbucks line, pay for the drink, pay it forward? No, man. He hadn't done lick. He had done nothing. You got to catch this. And the father, because of his nature, that he is benevolent, that he's not withholding, pours out affection over man. One of my favorite things, I got three kids, and one of the best things when you have kids is when they're little babies, and they, what happens is, like, you've seen it, like, anytime somebody hands you a baby, what is the first thing you do with the baby? Smile. You get awkwardly close, and you just start talking in a strange voice. Come on, you're all guilty. And you smile, just cheesing, just cheesing at the baby, smiling. One of the best things, though, about being a parent is that all of a sudden, there's a day, there's a moment when that baby responds to your smile and he smiles back. There's a moment when all of a sudden the smile, my smile, looks at my little buddy Billy who's six months old. There was a moment I was smiling over him. I couldn't help it. Cheesing over him every morning, just gushing affection, adoration over him. I love you, buddy. Oh, all of a sudden, one day, man, that smile, he mimics it back to me. You see, we're, we, we're created to mirror something. We're created to mimic something. The world that you're most aware of, you will mimic. Oh, I'm, I'm telling you, the world that you're most aware of, you will reproduce that in the earth. What do you think God's disposition is toward you? Come on, I told you we're going somewhere. He's coming after you tonight. It's him. It's not me. We love because he first loved us. The truth is that the enemy does not care if you come to Monday night. He doesn't care that you come. It doesn't matter to him. Doesn't matter if you go to your local church every Sunday and serve on the team and do the Wednesday night and serve in the youth ministry and take up the offering and go visit people in the hospital. It doesn't, really, doesn't matter. He doesn't care if you do that stuff. His greatest fear is that you and I would see the Father's smile and would be touched and lit on fire by it. And even more so that we would res reflect that smile back into the earth. He does not want you to see the smile. He'll do anything he can to keep you from experiencing the outlandish, offensive smile of the Father when you're in your most broken state. Come on, man. Adam hadn't done nothing nothing so the enemy has he's got different tactics or schemes that he uses against us and one of the main goals that he has and we see this scripturally is that one of his main schemes is to attack and distort our view of the father he plays his hand through scripture like if you would think at this point we would have caught on to his to his stuff. So we're going to, tonight, my, my hope is that this becomes so concrete in our soul that never again do we allow that distortion to come in. Though the enemy may try, I pray that tonight we would be so convinced of the smile, man, that we would just leave.
people would be so freaked out by us. We're walking down the street, just smiling ear to ear. Why are you so happy? Oh, let me tell you. Let me tell you. So here's the deal. Genesis shows us that the key role of the enemy is that of an accuser. Everybody say accuser. He's an accuser. So here's what happens. You know the story. I'm not going to go there and read it. I'm going to paraphrase it for us. Right? They're in the garden. Right? Adam wakes up, unbroken fellowship with uncreated beauty. I mean, like, perfect communion with God. Think about your best quiet time times a billion. Face-to-face with God in the garden. Face-to-face. That's, that's what he was born into. So he has this relationship. God makes Eve. Praise God. He's so happy. Things are going awesome. There's all this stuff, and there's just this one thing, right? Don't eat from this one tree. Everything else you can have. I just want you dependent on my love. Don't touch this, and we'll be good. So what happens is you know the story. Somehow the slithering snake gets in the garden, gets in the mix, and comes and accuses the father to Eve. Did God really say, I mean, Come on, Eve. You know God just doesn't want you to eat this tree because if you do, you'll become like him. Come on, God just wants to control you. He just wants to use you. He's not good. If he's good, why didn't he give you everything? Why is he so with, oh, Eve, he's withholding from you. Take the tree. Take of it. He accuses Adam and Eve, accuses the father to Adam and Eve, tempts them so that he can in turn have something to accuse them before the father. That's what he does forever. Every temptation you face in life, the enemy is tempting you so he can accuse you. That's what he does. So he tempts you and he tempts you and he tempts you until finally you give in to the temptation and then all of a sudden he's over just and now I can accuse you before the Father. This is all he's longing to do. So if we can catch this, come on, if we can catch this, we'll so quickly recognize the temptation be like, oh, I feel the accuser at work. So they eat of the tree. I bet tonight if we took a poll in here, lie detector test. We're not going to do it. Keep your hands down. <laughs> Keep your hands down. I bet tonight if we did a lie detector test under the Holy Spirit, said raise your hand if you have been under the weight of some type of accusation, I bet 99% of the room would raise their hand. That you've been under the weight of the accuser, accusing you of things you've done recently, Accusing you of things you've done 10 years ago, accusing you of things that were done to you, accusing you of fake things. Some type of accusation has been hurled at your life. I guarantee you tonight, Holy Spirit lie detector test, the majority of the room would raise their hand. So tonight, we're going to break the back of the accuser. Does that sound good? We're going to break his back and we're going to figure out how do we do it. How do we not just break his back one moment in a setting like this, but how do we let the love of God renew our mind so that we can live free from the accuser, live under that waterfall of the love of God consistently where the accusation comes and just falls off to the wayside because we're so drenched. We're so drenched. So here's here's the reality. The fall occurred before the fruit was ever eaten. The fall occurred before the fruit was ever eaten. The fall happened when they believed the lie that God wasn't good. The fall happened when they believed the lie. The belief birthed the action. God's not good. He's a withholding father. Give me the tree. And all of a sudden their eyes, says, were opened. And here's, here's, here's my dilemma. You're in this perfect relationship with God, right? Like, think about it. Like, think about that there's nothing hindering relationship. So there is no nagging accuser up to this point. There's no sin that's gotten the way. There is no performance in there, right? There is no, like, 
Um, does he like me today? I don't know. Like, no, it's like every day was perfect communion, perfect perfection. And then in a moment, because Adam and Eve believed a lie, what once was perfect communion has now been marred, and all of a sudden, where used to, they would run to the Father, now they're running to hide. Do you see how powerful our thoughts are? What you believe, oh, it matters so much. What you dwell on, what you think about when it comes to the Father, it means the world. It makes a massive difference. So all of a sudden, it says their eyes were open, and then they realized that they're naked, so they book it for the nearest tree, cover themselves with leaves, and then we see that all of a sudden, here comes the Father walking in the garden. Where are you? Where'd you go? Why are you hiding? Don't you remember me? And so what happened is all of the fear and the shame and the guilt from Adam disobeying, he now projects that onto the face of God. So now the loving father became an avengeful God. And you and I, we inherited a faulty and distorted view of what God is really like. How often do we do this? How often do we go through something and we project onto God what we're going through? All the time. All the time. Come on, put yourself in the shoes. You've, like, man, you've been doing all the right things and then, you know, things don't pan out as you want. Man, God doesn't love me. We buy into this lie, and, and all of a sudden we project all these things onto God. Man, maybe it's like you had a, a bad uh, experience with uh, some leader in your life or an authority figure in your life, or maybe it was your own father at home, and all of a sudden all these things, all these wounds that we experience, we project them back onto the father. Say, oh, well, if, man, father, I don't, I don't I, you know, I like Jesus, but father, I don't know, and then all of a sudden we think like that Jesus came to change the Father's mind about us when in reality Jesus had to come to change our mind about the Father. Jesus had to come and like he had to come and embrace our pain. We run from pain. We hide from pain. If pain's coming, come on, you know you book it the other way. Like I don't want to get in this relationship because I know I'm just going to get hurt. Dude, Jesus embraced your pain. He met you in the most broken, hurtful, painful moment of your life. Says, I'm going to reveal the Father to you in your pain, and you're going to see he's not the source. Oh, he's not the source. We live our lives, right? We pick the flower petals every day. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me today. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. And we just live in this mentality of like one moment we're doing good and the next we're not so all of a sudden it's love and we're like so prideful to think that our actions can actually change his character what makes us think come on what makes us think that we have the ability to change his nature messed up again today God hates me I know the Bible said he's love but and not after what I did. And we, and we like elevate ourselves above him and we think that we actually have control over how he feels about us. The enemy wants to distort our view of the father. But here's the deal. He's not fickle like you and I. He's not. Do you love that word fickle? He's not fickle. You, we're really good. Come on, be honest. Be honest, we, you and I are really good, and if we get offended at someone, we know how to distance ourselves. We scan the room. If they walk in that door, there's an exit over here. No, come on. I'm going to go out the back door today. You see him hanging out over there. So, uh, bro, you seem like you don't want to go see. Now, I forgave him, but I just, you know, I just guard my heart. Just, Guard my heart. You know, the Bible says guard your heart. You know, issues of life, that whole proverb thing. I, just, I guard my heart from them, man. I just, they're evil. Come on, we're so fickle. We change. We go back and forth, man. We make people earn their way back into relationship all the time. 
It's like they were just having an awful day one day, and they just said a passing comment. It wasn't even about you. You overheard and thought it was about you, and you've been mad for two weeks. And now finally, after three weeks, they brought you an In-N-Out burger because they know you've been so mad at them. And then finally, you smile at them, eat the burger, and you're like, okay, maybe we can, like, you know, maybe we can hang out again. When you were like best friends before, it's like in and out every day. And I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe. We're so fickle. Love that word. But here's the deal. The father is not schizophrenic. He doesn't have multiple personalities. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't have multiple personalities. The scriptures are so clear. Can I read you an outlandish verse? John 17, 22 and 23, the glory. Hang on. Everybody take a deep breath. Okay. you got to soak this in. The glory. You could read this. Listen, this verse, you should, you should mark this down, John 17, 22 and 23. You could spend the next 10 years. This is your verse. Oh, you would be, you would be just wreaking havoc on the earth for the love of God. The glory that you have given me, this is Jesus talking to the Father, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Okay. You could just stop there. But we're going to keep going for the sake of tonight. That they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, here's the kicker, And loved them even as you loved me. So that means that with the same intensity and passion and zeal and desire and affection and any other word you can think of that relates to those words, that same amount of love that the Father has for Jesus, he has for you. I didn't make it up. Jesus prayed that. Don't you think he would know? So why don't we believe it? Why do we live our lives thinking we have to earn it? Why? What is it in us that thinks we've got to perform our way into this outlandish love? What makes you think that you're that good of a performer? You're not. I'm definitely not. You don't want to see me dance. It's awful. Maybe you do. It'd be funny for you, but we're not going to do it. The same love and intensity of love. I mean, think about this. Come on. I'm getting angry. (laughs) Think about it. (laughs) Think about how much the Father must love Jesus. Like, let that thing sink in your heart for a moment. Sit in it. Don't just pass it by. You've read that verse. You just didn't stop at it. Stop at it. Soak it in. Now just watch the father. He's just pouring it out on his son. Now just watch him shift his attention a little and put it on you. And then live there. And stay there. And remain there. And when you're walking down the street, grab someone else and pull them into it. That's the Christian life. There's evangelism. Doesn't, it make, doesn't that make evangelism sound way more fun? Oh, we got to keep going. We're not going to get through half the notes, but that's okay. Romans 8, what can separate me from the love of God? I'm going to say it again. Who are we to think that we have the power to alter the Father's desire for us? You're not that cool. Neither am I. Praise the Lamb. But just because you and I are so good at keeping people at a distance who offend us, that does not mean that God operates that way. The Father does not operate that way. We got to stop projecting things onto Him. We got to see Him rightly. Come on, we got to receive the smile tonight. This is why we got to have our minds renewed, right? Don't be conformed to the world, the ways of the world. Be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Transformation comes when our mind is renewed. It's the love of the Father. He's trying to come. I need to fix your view about me. 
I honestly think probably the, he's probably saying, hey, stop doing evangelism for like a week. Let me settle some things about my character to you. Then go out and tell people about me. <laughs> the enemy always wants to attack our view of the Father. That's why when Jesus, he gets baptized, right? He's baptized in the waters of assurance he is the beloved son. Baptized, what happens? The father thunders from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Up to that point, if we just read scripture, we don't see Jesus having had done any miracles up to that point. Did he? I don't know. I'd be speculating. But what I know from Scripture, all I know is that at one point, Mary and Joseph thought he was with them, but he was back at his daddy's house, hanging out with the father. They're going on their way. Then they don't they realize, oh, where's Jesus? Oh, they go find him. He's 12 years old. He's like, i got to be on father's business. Other than that, we don't know much about his childhood. Why do I say that? Because he hadn't really shown, he hadn't really done the stuff. He hadn't done evangelism. He hadn't gone to the prayer meeting. He hadn't done a fast yet to our knowledge. The Father just saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased because that's who I am. I'm a love sick father. So he reveals his love for the son. And then it says that the spirit, right, it drives Jesus into the wilderness. And what happens in the wilderness? Here comes the accuser. If you really are the son of God, what's he doing? He's accusing the father what he said about Jesus. You see, you see the storyline? Do you see the narrative that the accuser is always trying to attack what the father has spoken about his children and about who he is? But Jesus was so baptized in the waters of assurance the accusation just fell to the wayside every single time. He said, oh, I've tasted the love of my father. Right? Because think about it. Jesus was fully God and fully man. So he laid aside his divine attributes. Like he really did embrace our existence. Like he embraced our flesh. Like he entered into our preconceived ideas of God. He says, I'm going to enter into your fallen state, but I'm going to refuse to be fallen, and I'm going to find the Father, and I'm going to take you there with me. So he refused the accuser. He, he refused those accusations. And then he goes about his business. He destroys the accuser. And so we need to be baptized in that type of assurance. But there's things that block us. Can we go into it just a little bit longer? You guys doing good? You tracking? Feeling okay? Is this, is this, is this making sense? Okay. So Luke 15, 1 and 2 says this. The tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Jesus to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Listen, Jesus was on a mission. His mission was to reveal the Father. Amen? What does it say Jesus did? He said, I only do that what I see my Father do. I'm only going to say what my Father's saying. Why? Because he was the exact representation of the Father. That's Hebrews 1. He's the express image, the radiance of God's glory. If you can't find it in the person of Jesus, you have to reshape your theology. If it's not in him, it's not in the Father. I already said it once. He didn't come to change the Father's mind about us. It's not like God was angry, humanity fell, and now Jesus is plan B. Got to fix this mess. Darn kids. I said, no, no. Jesus, from all eternity past, has known this outlandish love. I, I just can imagine, right? I'm just giving a little creative licensing here. I can just imagine that conversation between the Father, Son, and the Spirit. They're just looking on heartbroken. But Jesus, just knowing exactly what the Father would do before the Father ever said anything, he looks at the Father and says, I'm going to go and do it. How is it that Jesus on the cross can look at those killing him and say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. 
It's because he was so convinced of who the father was. He was so convinced of his nature. So the tax collectors and the sinners were drawing near to him. When sinners and tax collectors are drawing near to someone, take note. Why are they coming to this person? If a ton of sinners start hanging around you and being drawn to you, it's probably because you're very, you have a loving, welcoming presence. You see, they were outcasts. That's why the, the religious Pharisees, they were angry. Why, are the, why is this man eating and drinking with the, the tax collectors and the sinners? They're angry. So they, they're, they're grumbling. They say, he receives sinners and he eats with them. And so Jesus, knowing that, he tells the Pharisees a parable. So think about this. We read this parable and it's really good. We're like, oh yeah, the Father's good. Jesus is declaring this parable into the face of religion. The most religious people on the earth in that day, Jesus is looking them face to face. They're angry. He says, I'm going to tell you a story. Should we read it? Let's read it. You can turn there, Luke 15. Luke 15, starting at verse 11. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. He divided his property between them, and not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living, and when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Let's stop right there. So I'm going to give some credit here to Tim Keller. He has an incredible book. You can go read it. He goes way more in depth, and we're going to have time to go in here, but it's called The Prodigal God. You should go read it. It's incredible. And his whole premise is that he, he frames this story and that we often call it the prodigal son because the pr- prodigal literally means like, like reckless. It means like, you just, like you're just giving everything away. And his whole point is that the prodigal in the story is the father. It's not the son. It's the father. And so Jesus is telling the story to the Pharisees. So what you see is you have, he says there's two sons. And if you think about Luke 15, um, 1 and 2, there was two groups. Tax collectors and sinners and Pharisees. So the tax collectors and the sinners represent the younger brother in the story, and the Pharisees represent the older brother. You tracking? Okay. So again, you can check Tim Keller's book out. It's amazing. I'm I'm pulling a little bit from it here. I think this is going to land it in our hearts, okay? So when, when the younger son asks for his inheritance, he's asking for land. So that would be the main thing they own. They own. So it says he, he divides his property. So he's basically saying, usually what would happen is that the father would die, and then two thirds of the inheritance would go to the older brother, the oldest, and then one third to the younger. And so what the younger son is saying is, "Hey, here's the deal. I don't want to wait till you die. You're basically dead to me now. I want my inheritance." That's what he says to the father. "You're dead to me. Give me what's mine. I have my own way. I want to do things. Hand it over." Papa. So he says that, and basically it's the most disrespectful thing he can do to the father. Wishes that he was, says, you know, you're dead to me. And so he's basically saying, I want your things, I just don't want you. I want the stuff you can give me, but I want nothing to do with you. So his relationship to the father had been a means to an end. He wants out. Give me what's mine. So the father divides the property, divides his land. And so Tim Keller says this, says, In that culture, to lose part of your land was to lose part of yourself and a major share of your standing in the community. So the younger brother is asking his father, basically saying, I want you to tear your life apart for me. And the father does for the love of his son. So can you imagine the Pharisees are hearing this story and they're like, they know the culture and they're like, what kind of father would yield to such a disrespectful son 
and tear his life apart to give him his inheritance that he's going to go squander. Like, where, where are we going? So most of um, Jesus' listeners would have never seen a Middle Eastern patriarch respond like this. This is where we, we're really good at rejecting people, but this is where enduring love comes in. The father maintains his affection for his son, and he bears the agony. So let's keep reading. Verse 17. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I'll arise, go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. So it says he comes to himself and he's going to go back. He has this speech prepared and he's going to go ask him to um, become, you know, treat me as one of your hired servants. Basically, in that culture, like he, him coming back, like he was going to have to pay off his debt to be reinstated back into the family. So he's basically saying, give me a job. I'll pay off my debts. I want to pay off my debts. I want to pay off what I owe you. Put me to work. But the father has a different plan in his mind. And it says that he looked to his servants and said, go get the best robe and put it on him. The best robe in the house would have been the father's robe. The best robe in the house would have been the father's robe. This is an unmistakable sign of being restored into the family. The son is saying, I want to pay off my debts. The father is saying, you're not paying off anything. I'm putting my robe around you. You are reinstated right now. He doesn't want to wait until he pays off his debts. I'm taking you back. I'll cover your nakedness. I'll cover your poverty and rags with the robes of my office and honor. And he puts the ring on his finger. If you remember back in Genesis, what happened when they found out they were naked? God kills an animal and he covers them. We're seeing that this parable is the story of all of human history. In this one story, can we keep going? So they begin to celebrate, but here's the deal. His older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants, and he asked what these things meant, and he said to him, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry, and he refused to go in. His father came out and treated him, and he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured, check that out, this son of yours, when he came, he's devoured your property with prostitutes. You kill the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive he was lost and is, in, and is now found. A few key things to take uh, from this section is that this would have been a community celebration. And so the fact that the older brother refuses to go into this feast is of just as much disrespect to the father as the son wanting his inheritance and leaving. He refuses to go in. And he publicly is casting his vote saying, I don't agree with your decision. Tim Keller says this, he is especially upset about the cost of everything that's happening. You see, here's the deal. Because he reinstated, follow track with me, because he had reinstated the younger son, 
that means that now he had another inheritance in the family. So he already lost his third. So now the older brother is going to lose part of his inheritance to give it to the younger son. So he's angry. He's saying, I've done, check that verse out. He said in verse 29, these many years I have served you and I've never disobeyed your command. So we said at the beginning, it's possible to live in the father's house, do everything that the father says, but yet not actually want the father. The older brother wanted the same thing. He was just trying to get it through his obedience. This is what Tim Keller says, quote unquote, I've worked myself to death and earned what I've got, but my brother has done nothing to earn anything. Indeed, he's merited only expulsion, and yet you lavish him with wealth. Where's the justice in that? That's why the elder brother refers to his record. I've never disobeyed you. I have rights. I deserve to be consulted about this. You have no right to make these decisions without me. How often do we try to control outcomes and control God by our obedience? God, I've done all these things. Why aren't you elevating me? My character's flawless. I love people. I walk old ladies across the street. I pay for people in the, in the Starbucks line behind me. Why don't I have 100,000 followers on Instagram? Why don't I get all the likes? Why does nobody reshare me? Why don't I get a microphone? When's my time? And we think that our obedience can manipulate God so that we can get what we want. And God is withholding all those things because he knows the moment you get those, you're going to be so unsatisfied. You see, the son in the house and the son who went wayward, they both had the same problem. They just thought all these things were going to solve the deep-seated wounding that they actually needed a loving father. And so this story, it offers two worldviews. It offers those who go out and do their own thing and think, I want to be my own God. I want to make my own rules. And it also embodies those who we get so bound up in religious duty, thinking that if we just obey and do the right next thing, all will end up well for us. But that's not how the world works. That's not how God works. They didn't love the father for who he was. They were using the father for their own self-centered ends rather than loving, enjoying, and serving him for his own sake. Tim Keller says this, This means that you can rebel against God and be alienated from him either by breaking his rules or by keeping all of them diligently. They thought possessions, they thought wealth, they thought these things would fulfill them. But it was the true love of the Father. You see, here's the deal. Jesus kind of ends the parable and it's like, what, what happens? What, what's the outcome? The point of the story is that we need a true older brother. It was the older brother's job. The older brother in this story should have seen how distraught the father was that his younger son had left. And the older brother should have been gripped with compassion and says, Dad, I'm going to go get my brother for you. But instead, religious obligation, thinking that I'm just going to do the right next thing until I get what I want, kept him from truly loving the father and receiving the love of the father. Who's seen the movie, the Jesus Revolution movie? Who's seen it yet? If you haven't seen it, I'm going to give you a little spoiler, so sorry. But if you haven't seen it at this point, I mean, come on. Go see it. Um, I was thinking about this scene in the movie where right, all the hippies start coming in the church. You guys know the scene. And, and then there's this one moment in the movie when it's like you got all the old, you know, like, sorry, you guys are kind of the old church people. I'm so sorry. So you're the old church people that have been coming to the church, and then you guys are the hippies. Hippies over here. And so all these hippies come in, and then all of a sudden in the movie, you see like 
these old men get up and just give this stern look uh, up to the pastor, and then they leave the building. But there's one man who, who stands up and walks over and sits in between all the hippies and puts his arms around and is like, let's do this. That's the two attitudes. Self-righteousness that doesn't understand mercy. Come on. Can't receive love, doesn't know how to give love. Come on, we've built this church. We've done all, we've tithed. This is our church. They're ruining the carpet. That was a real response. They leave the building. You see, self-righteousness does not know how to love because it's never been loved. It's never received loved. It's received love. It's so caught up in being a busybody for God, trying to manipulate outcomes instead of seeing that God's not a divine bookkeeper. He's a heartbroken, lovesick father. That's who he is. So the father, he both embraces the wayward and he makes space. He offers his please to the self-righteous, come in and feast. Everything I have is yours. Come into the party. But there's something about religion that refuses to celebrate when the broken get restored. Religion loves to keep track of people's wrongdoings. We are so good at recognizing people by their dysfunction. Why is it that when we read John chapter 4, our first thought is that that woman must be a prostitute and she must have cheated on all her husbands? It doesn't say that. It just says that she's had five husbands and the guy she's living with is not her husband. What if all of her previous husbands were losers and they never did love her well and they cheated on her? Come on. Why is it that we always love to see the worst in people? We recognize people by their dysfunction. Jesus and the Father look at potential. Say, oh, I know how I made you. This is just a season of waywardness. I'm waiting on the porch. Come on. The Father didn't wait for the Son. He's like, oh, I'm going to let him do the walk of shame and come up and give his speech. No, the Father bore the shame. The community had to see him. He hiked up his gown. He booked it. He ran after him, was showing his skinny, scrawny legs. He embraced the Son. Get my robe. Reinstate him into the family right now. Religion, man, just sits back. He's going to do it again to you. Won't last. Why, why is it that we're so quick to do that? Because we've never received love. We don't understand that we're all in the same boat and we desperately need mercy. We desperately need mercy. It's 8.15. telling you what time it is in case you got to go I just feel tonight that the Lord wants to pick a fight with us because here's the deal there is another Jesus revolution like it's at the doorstep and there will be a moment when whatever room we're in it won't be this one because we won't, we won't be able to fit in here There'll be a moment when coming through those doors are not the people that you would think should be coming in through the doors. I'm telling you this. When you get on the other side, when all is said and done, I'm telling you, you're going to be shocked at who's in the kingdom. No, no, you don't get it. You're going to be so shocked. They made it in? How? How did they get here? Jesus is just going to smile. Oh, they received my smile. Oh, come on. His mercy is so offensive. It's so offensive to the natural mind. He's, he, doesn't, he doesn't work the same way we work. So when that happens, when, when, the, when, when the Jesus movement that's at the doorstep, when that thing busts through the door, what is going to be our response? Will you be one of those who have received the smile of the Father and in turn can smile at those coming? Or will you be the religious naysayer sits in the back? They won't last. What about when the next Lonnie Frisbee gets born again and radically saved and he gets the microphone before you do? What will I do when all of a sudden the next Lonnie Frisbee gets up and he's got more anointing, more revelation, more love, more power, and all of a sudden God says, I want to elevate this one. I want you to serve him. What will be our response? Religion 
Come on, the religious bone in our body will say he's not ready. The religious bone in my body will say, no, 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 he hasn't gone through the proper, you know, uh, he hasn't served long enough to get there. I've served for a decade. I'm just giving you, come on, can we be honest about this tonight? That we got to get doused in mercy. We got to become the most merciful, love filled generation that the earth has ever seen because the broken are coming. They're waiting, they're longing, and God's saying, I'm holding them back because I need you to get a little bit more merciful before I let them in. Because if they came in today, you might not represent me the way I am. So I'm going to hold them back just a little bit longer, a little bit longer. And he's the father smiling on the room tonight saying, will you receive my smile? Will you lay aside your religion that says you can earn this? I'm telling you, the father's saying, my love is so outlandish, there is no possible way you could ever earn it. Your righteous deeds are like filthy rags, man. They're not going to get you anything. Chuck them in the garbage, dude. God loves you because he's love. You got to believe it tonight. Whether you're the wayward son you've been running tonight, man, the father is running after you. I'm telling you. Or if you've been thinking about running, he's, his hand's raised, he's going to snatch your collar, pull you back in. So you're not going anywhere. If you've been caught up in that religious cycle, thinking that you're going to work your way in and earn it and do all the right things so that you get the stuff, man, Tonight, the father's not angry at you. He's smiling at you saying, man, I know my smile can, it can get through that religion if you'll, just, if you'll just look at me for a second. Self-righteousness looks at itself. Older brother looked at himself. He's just saying, just lift your eyes up. Look at me for a moment. Let me love you. Let me love you. And receive my love tonight. Don't leave without receiving it. Don't leave without receiving it. You got to sit in it. You got to sit in that John 17. The same way the father is so madly in love with Jesus. That's how he feels about you right now. Not because of what you've done or haven't done. Because that's who he is. I'm going to say it over and over and over again until it breaks through your heart tonight because I'm telling you, God wants to prepare us. You can't live out 1 Corinthians 13 without being touched by this love. Attach yourself to it. Be lit on fire by it. You have to. I'm, I'm lingering because I don't, I don't even want the band to come up right now. I want you to sit in this truth. I don't want to stir up your emotions. I want you to be hungry for his love, knowing that he wants to meet you. It's not the guitar chord that's going to make his presence come in the room. No, he's here. He's here. And he's in your house when you're there. He's in your car when you're driving down the road. And he's just waiting. He said, if you just look at me, you'll see my smile. And everything can change. I can renew your mind. He said, I know that your father was abusive. I know that your dad was controlling. I know your dad withheld from you. I know that your dad was so critical of you. I know you grew up under the weight of that criticism and you never felt like you could amount up. I know he was doing the best he could. He, he didn't see my smile either, man. Let go of that pain tonight, man. Just let the Father's smile come wash over you. Saying, I know that, man, that, that leader in your life, he didn't have it all together. He manipulated you. I know, man, I know, I know, I know. I know he did. He hadn't seen my smile either in a long time. He was under a lot of pressure. I'm sorry you had to be the bearer of that, but oh, I just, let my smile wash it away. He wants, to, he wants to meet your wounds tonight with a smile, with his love, with his tender mercy. I know, oh, I know that, 
I know that past boyfriend. I know what he did. Oh, you didn't deserve that. I'm going to deal with him. I'm going to talk to him. But tonight, I want to heal that place. I know that girl. I know what happened. I know you loved her. I know you gave everything. I get it. She wasn't ready. I know, man. But, oh, I'm ready for you. I got love for you. We got to give it over to him. You got to give it over to him. All your disappointments. You thought you should be somewhere else right now. You thought you should be at a better job. Better level of ministry, more responsibility. Ah, it's coming, man. I'm telling you, when this Jesus movement comes to our door and busts through, there's going to be a job for everyone. No one's going to get bored right now. You should be, man, thank Jesus that it's not fully in the room and that you can just, for a moment, you can just receive tonight. He said, I need to prepare your heart. I got to get you ready. I got to get you ready. I know you, wanna be, I know you wanted to be there. I'm going to get you there. But that thing's not going to fulfill you. I want to fulfill you now so that when you get there, you have authority. I want to I work in you now so that when it's time, oh, man, you're ready. Because he's looking at me and saying, man, you says this to me often, Zach, you let the praises of people to get to you a little, gets in there a little too much. We've all heard the line, if you live by the praises, you'll die by the criticism. So he just said, I just, oh, let me just tweak this thing in you. Because they're going to say stuff, man. Religion hates love. Right? Hates it. Hates mercy. I just, I just, man, I just need to flood you with my mercy so that when that stuff comes, when the accusation comes, man, you're like Jesus. You're living under the waterfall of being the beloved son of the father, the beloved daughter of the father. And your mind gets renewed and you start living your life, seeing him rightly. You wake up in the morning, you say, I have nothing to prove to anyone. No one owes me anything. I'm loved by my father. I'm loved by my father. I'm loved by my father. My boss owes me nothing. My coworker owes me nothing. My pastor owes me nothing. My parents owe me nothing. My siblings owe me nothing. My spouse owes me nothing. I'm loved by my father. I'm going to live under that waterfall today, and I'm going to pull everyone in around me. That's why Jesus, man, it wasn't his giftedness that got him through Gethsemane. Come on, it wasn't his being so gifted that he got there. No, he was heartbroken. He knew who he was. That's why he could look at his, those who crucified him. Father, forgive them. Forgive them. They don't know. They don't know. They don't know. They don't get it. I want you to stand with me tonight. The band, you guys can come on back up. We're going to spend these final moments together. I just believe the Lord wants to just, the Lord wants to minister to us. The Father wants to smile down on you. He does not want you to leave this place without that baptism of assurance. I don't know where you're at on the spectrum. I don't know if you're the wayward son or the older brother. It doesn't matter to me. Don't raise your hand. It doesn't matter. We all need that same love of the Father tonight. I want to invite you, if you want to come forward, we're going to, do, we're going to worship. You don't have to, but if you just want to come, if you, if you just know, man, I just need the smile tonight. I need, I need to know that love. I need it real. I need, to, I need to touch it. I need to get myself attached to that thing. I just want to make space. We don't, I don't want anyone praying for anybody right now. I just want you and the Father. I want you to let the Father do business with your heart. You guys can come on around wherever you want to get. Just let the Father do business. I'm going to pray. We're going to go into worship. We'll, we'll kind of ebb and flow for a few moments together and just let the, let the Holy Spirit do what he wants to do tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of your Son, we ask that you would come. Loving Father, kind, merciful, smiling Father, would you come? Would you come by the Spirit? Come. Come. We pray for just the water, the waterfall of your love. Holy Spirit, let it just crash on every heart. Every heart longing, 
needing, just needing the love, the affirmation, the affection of their Father. Come, Holy Spirit, and do what only you can do. Do what only you can do. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. We're going to let the worship team play and sing and just want you to engage and we'll we'll move in and out of some ministry. I just want to make a little bit of space here that just that the Father can come and do what He wants to do in your heart.
I really feel that the Lord wants to heal deep, deep, just wounds on the inside. And I just feel I, none of us, I'm gonna preface this, none of us in the room have a perfect earthly father. I'm not a perfect earthly father for my kids. You don't have a perfect earthly father. So this is not about putting our, our parents on blast or anything like that. This is just about the love of the heavenly father wanting to come and renew your mind and reveal his character to you by healing the wounds that have been left on you. And I just feel tonight, if there's some of you who you just know, man, I have wounds from my father tonight that I just need the, the heavenly father to come and heal the wound. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to get there, but you just know deep down. I just know that I know that I need this. I just want to ask if you would just be so bold to just raise your hand. We just want to pray for you. If there's anyone in the room, circuit rider, staff, if you see hands going up, I just want you to go and just lay a hand on. I'm going to pray. And we're just going to pray that by the Spirit, if you're a circuit rider, staff, can you just move around the room? We're going to pray that by the Spirit, I just, I just believe that there's going to be a transaction of the love of the Father tonight that's just going to wash away. It's going to heal wounds. Some of you are going to need to forgive your Father. You're going to need to forgive that person in your life. And as you release forgiveness, I'm telling you, just the wave of the love of God, the smile of the Father is going to wash over you. So I'm going to pray for you. We're going to go back into this song. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every hand that was raised. I speak to every wound deep within and say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come and do what only you can do. Let the love of God wash over and heal you in Jesus' mighty name. I just believe some of you need to just release forgiveness. There's just, you've been holding on to that forgiveness. The Lord's saying, offer forgiveness, release them from your life. And I just see just waves of healing all across the room, just every wound being healed. Wounds being healed, forgiveness being released. The love of the Father, that waterfall, that assurance washing over you. Come on, we're gonna go back into this. We're gonna sing this out together. That He loves us, that He loves us. Come, love of God, love of God, come. Crash over the room. Crash over the room. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come.
tonight if you're in the room and, and you just know that you've actually never really truthfully surrendered your life to this love. You've been thinking you've got to do all these things right to get salvation. You just know in your heart of hearts that you've never been baptized with this assurance that you're loved by God and that you have forgiveness of your sins through what Jesus has accomplished. I just want to give a, a space for just that, for, where it's like you're, this is like a first time moment for you where you're like, I just need to fully surrender to this and really get true salvation that only Jesus can bring. I just want to ask you to be bold enough tonight. If there's anyone in the room and you say, tonight I need to make that surrender. I want to receive this love tonight. I want to give up my trying and my works and all my good deeds. And I want to surrender to the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ alone. Is there anyone in the room that would raise their hand and say, tonight that's me? Come on. Come on. Anyone else that tonight you just feel it in your heart. Come on. I see it. Come on. If you're a circuit rider staff, you just get around. I just want to pray right now. Holy Spirit, just let the love of the Father crash over. Let salvation spring up tonight. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for the gift of the love of the Father. Come on, as a whole room tonight, here's what I, here's what I want to declare. Then we're going to go back into a song and we'll land it here soon. But I want us to declare this out. I want us to declare out that we receive the smile of the Father tonight. I'm telling you, there's still, a, there's just still a part in the room that's just resisting. You just aren't there yet. I just feel it tonight that the Lord wants to break through. He wants to make you love sick by revealing His love sickness for you. So, if you don't mind, I want to ask just as a, as a posture of receiving, just either put your hands out in front of you or put them up in, in the air, just in a place of receiving. And I want you to say this with me. Say, in the name of Jesus, tonight I receive the smile of my Father. I receive the outlandish, the unearned love of God. Tonight I declare my Father madly loves me the same way He loves Jesus. He loves me the same way He loves Jesus. He loves me the same way He loves Jesus. He loves me. So tonight, I receive the love of God. Come on, give a shout to Jesus. Give a shout to Him tonight. Bless His name tonight. Come on, we're going to go back into some worship. Just come on, keep lifting your voice for a moment. Just thank Him for His love tonight. Thank you for his love. We bless you, Jesus. We thank you for the love of God. We thank you for the love of the Father. Oh, we bless you.
final thing we're gonna we're gonna let go of tonight is that any way comparison has stolen the Father's love for you. Where you've compared your life to others, you've compared what you've accomplished or haven't accomplished or whatever it may be, whatever that thing is that you desire, you see in others, you're like, I'm not there, and you've compared and contrasted your life with others, and you've just come to the conclusion that you're not worthy of love. Tonight, we're kicking that thing in the face. Come on, that's the accuser. That's the accuser. And the Father's saying, oh, I love you for you. I love you for you. So say this with me. Say in Jesus' name, tonight, I let go of comparison. Oh, we got to do it again. Say, in the name of Jesus, I let go of all comparison. No longer will comparison rob me of the love of God. He loves me because 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 he loves me. Come on, you got to believe it because he loves me. Come on, Jesus loves you. Not because of what you can do for him. Say it with me one more time. Say, I receive the smile of my father. Oh man, just sit in it for a moment. Oh, just sit in his smile. Just sit in his smile. Come on, it should make you smile. It should make you happy. make you happy. When I was in when I was in Teen Challenge, we would walk the halls and one of our pastors, he would, if we had a sour look on our face and we were like frowning, he would walk up to us and he would say, you need to notify your face. He would say, were you baptized in lemon juice? I used to get, we would get, people would get so offended. But then we realized, no, he's seen the smile. Come on, it should make you smile. Say this with me. Say, I'm going to notify my face. The Father loves me. Holy Spirit, I pray that tonight, Lord, that you would seal this revelation, that you would renew our minds daily. You would continue to renew our minds. I pray that just every day this week that we would wake up and the first thing we would see would not be our phone, would not be our Instagram feed, would not be our emails, would not be what it fill in the blank. I pray that the first thing we would see is the smile of the Father. Lord, open our eyes to see it this week. Lord, renew our mind by your smile. Renew our mind. Let us see you rightly so that we can mirror to the world the smile of the Father found in the person of Jesus Christ. Make us the most mercy-filled, loving generation. I pray, Holy Spirit, that this room would get so doused this week in the love of God. Man, that we would just become undone, Lord, by your love. Touch us with your love. Set us aflame, Lord. Send us out as burning ones filled with the love of God. Rewire our thinking. Teach us to love like you, Jesus. We bless you tonight. We bless you tonight, Holy Spirit. We thank you for the revelation of the love of the Father. Seal it in our hearts. Send us into the world the same way you sent Jesus, filled with mercy. Prepare us for this next Jesus movement that's at the doorstep, Lord. Prepare us. Let us be, I pray that this would be the most welcoming, loving community, standing firm on truth, but not compromising mercy. Oh, make us so filled with truth and filled with love, Lord, just like Jesus. Amen. Well, my prayer is that you would be so filled with God's love this week and that he would just never leave you alone. That he would haunt you down. He would hunt you down. He would just, he would keep nagging at you until you let his love break through every exterior. 
And when you feel his love getting close, don't back away, don't hide, yield. My challenge to you is that every time we gather, I dare you to become the most yielded person in the room to the love of God. What would this room look like if we had a little friendly competition? Who's the most yielded to the love of God? Not in a comparison way, we got rid of that, in a fun way, yielding to his love, yielding to his love. Come on. Well, love you guys, such an awesome night. We got our greenhouse happening this week, Wednesday, Thursday, come jump in. Have an awesome week. May the love of God just overwhelm you, mess you up forever, keep you there, never let you return normal. We'll see you next week.